Hello, all you lovely people. Welcome back to the Cinema Asylum podcast. We are so glad that you decided to join us today. Um, if you have seen our past videos and you like our content, please make sure to like and subscribe. And um, on today's uh, video, uh, I'm doing our uh, little segment just with me today. Um, and for today's review, I'm going to be talking about the new uh, horror thriller film directed by Osgood Perkins, and that is Long Legs. Um, if you have not heard about this film yet, um, I'm, I'd be very surprised because this movie's been marketed like crazy uh, the past couple months or so. Um, and now that it's been out for like about a week now, um, it's already been out for like two weekends, and it's doing insanely well at the box office right now like surprisingly so i mean usually a movie like this from a smaller distributor distributor like neon studios who, which hasn't even been a, around that long um but they put out movies like uh parasite um and i think they put out itania too um but they they're not really like huge huge like some some of the other big studios out there and this is been their most successful film like so far as of late um and i'm so glad that they're having this kind of success in the summer for a horror film no less and for a horror film like this specifically um so uh the plot revolves around a uh it's basically as have you as you probably heard about the film it's very much a silence of the lambs meets seven meets uh, a bunch of supernatural elements. Uh, it really goes back to those 90s uh, manhunt FBI th crime thrillers that you saw, like Seven. Um, and this revolves around an uh, uh, FBI agent by the, name, by the name of Lee Harker, who is played by Micah Monroe, um, as she is assigned a, ta um, a specific case revolving around these series of mass murders of all these different families across the past 30 years or so. And it, the movie takes place in Oregon and it takes place in uh, the late nineties, I believe. And it definitely, it definitely takes place during the, um, the Bill Clinton era, as you see Bill Clinton's uh, portrait uh, in many scenes in the film. So she's assigned this case and in each of the murders that has happened in these, in these like 30 years of history, um, the, an entire family is killed, and it's uh, usually committed by uh, the father figure, and it's usually it usually ends in them committing suicide, um, and it's just it's just brutal murders happening. And in each of these murders, they get these letters by um, this person named Longlegs, and um, and these letters are written in this very um, these coded. It was Zodiac Killer esque, um, Zodiac Killer esque alphabet, and it, she is assigned this case. And it, sh this the movie basically is about her revealing how these murders happened, uh, how Long Legs is involved with these killings, and if there is indeed like something supernatural going on uh, that's causing these murders to happen. And that's all I can really get into without getting into major spoilers uh, revolving around what happens in the film. And there's some pretty shocking events that happen in the film and revelations uh, that I will get into in the spoiler section, which I will uh, save for the last part of the video. So um, for those who may who have seen uh, the past episodes with, with me and him, um, you know that you probably heard me say that this was my most anticipated film of the summer. Um, I was eagerly excited for this film uh, just because I am a massive horror fan and I'm also just I'm also uh, really into these indie horrors like that uh, neon and a24 have been putting out and I just I really I love horror movies like this that revolve around like true crime aspects um, that do and in some cases have that kind of supernatural edge to them that set them apart from movies like uh, Sil Silence of the Lambs or uh, Zodiac or Seven, uh, those very uh, David Fincher-esque films that I love. But I like films that kind of uh, inject something unique into it, like a supernatural or satanic edge. 
um, something like uh, one of my favorite horror films of all time did in 2012, which was Sinister, which also has that kind of true crime uh, story to it, but it has a lot of that supernatural, uh, has a lot of that supernatural flavoring to it, which I adore. Um, and in my opinion, this movie's been getting a ton of hype, and a lot of people. A lot of audiences, because of how much hype has been around the film, saying that this is bit this is the scariest film of the decade, and some people have even said that this is actually one of the scariest films of all time. Is it? Do I think it is one of the scariest films of all time? I wouldn't say so, like specifically, um, but for me anyway, um, this film is one of the most atmospheric unsettling and creepy films that I've seen in many years. Uh, I think this film, um, I don't think this film is outright trying to scare you, but I think it, the main j job I think that the film and the main target of the film uh, or, or how uh, Osgood Perkins was aiming for was to make you as uncomfortable as you could with the atmosphere that the film creates with the performances, especially from Nicolas Cage, who plays long legs in the film. And they've marketed that brilliantly by not showing Nicolas Cage at all in the trailers or the commercials for the film. And uh, they, they've, you've, in the trailers, you, you hear him, you hear some of the dialogue that he gives, but they're not giving you the full context of the scenes that those are coming from. And, um, when you see Nick Cage in the film, you will realize why they didn't show him in any of the marketing for this. Because uh, what they did to Nicolas Cage in the film in terms of how he looks is uh, is something that I'm going to be that people are going to be remembering for a long time. Just because if you see him in the film and you didn't know it was Nicolas Cage you would never have guessed it. <laughs> That's all I'll say about that. But um, yeah, I I loved how atmospheric the film was. It, the film immediately from the opening shot just puts, puts you in this uncomfortable mood, in this uncomfortable environment with the sound design, with the eerie cinematography and how um, most of the film is shot with these uh, wide angle lenses. Um, and the and the camera doesn't really move that much. Um, the camera is mainly just put on a tripod like you see right here. Um, and it's it just allows you to suck in every little bit of the the settings and the like the different locations that the film takes place in. And it usually has the the main the characters that are in these frames very small in the frame, a lot of wide shots in the film that just that make you feel, like anything can happen to these characters when they're in these locations. Um, even when something um, doesn't happen, it just, it still makes you feel that anxiety that, uh, that any good horror film should do or any good psychological thriller should do. Um, there's so many scenes in the film and I've seen this movie three times, by the way, in, in the past two weeks, I've seen this movie three times. Um, each time I've seen this, I've got I've seen it with someone else and each time there's several shots in the film where it has a character in the center of the frame like Micah Monroe um there's a scene in the film where she's on the phone talking to a, another character and in the in, on both sides of the frame there's these empty corners there's these empty rooms that you can see in door in door frames and you just feel like something is going to appear on both sides of the frame or on either side of the frame like it it just makes you feel like that will happen uh, even when it doesn't and there there's many moments in the film where something does pop up very sudden like very subliminally but it doesn't call attention to it and i that's the kind of horror that really just unsettles me i i don't like horror movies that rely on jump scares i don't like horror movies that rely so much on the over-the-top musical score and, you know, films that rely so much on, like, moving moving the camera camera so much to where, like, it's just, it's it's calling attention to the scares 
and not allowing you to feel and not allowing you to feel the dread. Um, the, these are, of course, techniques that have been um, used by some of the greatest filmmakers of all time, like Stanley Kubrick, who obviously had influenced uh, Osgood Perkins uh, when he made this film. And you can hear him talk about that in interviews, how uh, movies like The Shining and a lot of other Kubrick films inspired the, uh, this film and how it looks. Um, but yeah, I loved, not only did I love how atmospheric the film is, I also, I also loved it all, the, almost all the performances in the film. Um, and it, the, the acting in the film doesn't like the cinematography, doesn't call, doesn't really call attention to itself much except for Nicolas Cage. And that's by design. Uh, Mike and Monroe is very, you can definitely feel like something is off about her. Um, and the, I won't get into exactly what is going on with that character until uh, the spoiler section, but throughout the beginning of the film, you definitely get the sense that this character uh, has something that is on her mind constantly. Like um, in the film, um, the film uh, almost immediately sets up that her character has some kind of psychic ability uh, when she's investigating all these uh when she's investigating all these scenes and all these crime scenes and she's going through evidence, you feel like she's, she's in, in, she has some kind of intuition that's giving her this information and you're not entirely sure how she's getting it until the, until closer to the third act. Um, and I love it. She plays that part so well, in my opinion. And um, she plays it very awkwardly, like someone um, with that kind of ability and, when you learn what is is wrong with her, um, it makes her performance uh, feel more authentic, and it f makes you feel more for that character and uh, so much more. Um, you also have Blair Underwood, who plays a very charismatic and uh, sarcastic uh, police chief or FBI chief in this case. Um, has a ton of great lines. Um, as really, he really does add a ton of um, almost comedic weight to the film, even though um, the character's not, like, outright funny. Like, you definitely uh, feel like a load is taken off whenever that character's on screen because so much of the film feels so heavy and it, it feels so dread-inducing that whenever that character's on screen, you feel like, um, you, feel like you can have a moment to breathe uh, in, in whatever scenes he's in. Um, you also have Alicia Witt who plays, uh, Lee Harker's mom in the film and, uh, she gives a, a fantastic performance and she really, towards the third act, she, you really, uh, get a, a good deal of, um, of scenes with her and, um, yeah, uh, you, she, that character has a ton of, a ton of screen time and later on and, um, she did a fantastic job, um, so let's get into Nicolas Cage in the film, who, um, aside from all the makeup, which I've already talked about, um, I am a die. I become such a fan of Nicolas Cage uh, throughout the years, and especially recently, because um, Nicolas Cage, like a decade ago, was really struggling to find roles that were worth a damn and movies that were worth a, any kind of wor worth any kind of a shit, really. Um, and that's due to the fact that, you know, he dealt with tax issues, so he kind of had to take as many roles and jobs as he could, and that's why he was in so many terrible movies uh, the past decade or so. And it wasn't until, I think it was until, it was the movie Mandy from 2018 that kind of got him back on the right track and got, made him, and allowed him to take on more interesting roles and more interesting movies like Mandy or pig or the unbearable weight of massive talent. Um, and it wasn't, uh, and, uh, when he took the role of Dracula and Renfield, that was when he, I feel like he was able to take more, um, of those studio driven, uh, roles that he got a ton of in the early two thousands in the, uh, late nineties. Um, and he's still doing really interesting indie and smaller roles like this. And I'm so grateful for it because, he is full out Nick Cage in the film, and it, it's it's one of the first times where a Nick Cage performance, when he 
does go full Nick Cage, where he does go full loony and completely bonkers in a performance. It almost feels like it, this almost was like the first time I've ever been truly scared of Nick Cage, like in a, in a crazy role like this, because he's had a, a lot of like s- more subtle roles, um, but he's had a lot more, you know, crazy over the top performances. And usually in those kinds of over the top roles, he's still kind of funny and humorous. And I'm not going to lie. Some of the, on rewatches, you know, some of the scenes in the film revolving around the killer of long legs and Nicolas Cage's character and his performance, it, it does induce, it can induce laughter for a lot of audiences for sure. But for me, at least most of the film, I was just kind of like in awe of his performance. Like I am genuinely creeped out by you. And it's not often that I get that from a Nicolas Cage performance. And I really have to give so much praise to him and um and the makeup department as well they for just truly creating a really unique kind of serial killer that you've never really seen before in a movie like this and um yeah truly got to give it to the to the film for making me one of the for making me truly scared of nick cage which i don't know if i've ever felt that emotion from him in any movie I've ever seen him in. Um, so yeah. Uh, I really want to get into spoilers for the film. Um, uh, so I'm going to wrap up my like non-spoiler thoughts on this. Overall, I I don't know if this is going to scare people like the marketing has pointed out, but for me anyway, I was truly, the past, all three times I've seen this film, it has just put me in a mood and has made me uncomfortable. And any horror film that can do that um, is doing something right, where it just, you you don't come out of the film, um, you come out of the film and you go home and you think about certain scenes in in the story and certain scenes that really just put you on edge. And that's the kind of horror that, for me, is the most effective. The, the horror movie that doesn't scare you on you know immediacy but scares you on reflection and i i really do think osgood perkins really did a tremendous job in with this film and managing to accomplish that feat and i'm so glad that this film is doing well and audiences are getting into it or at least or or at least talking about it because um, this is obviously not a movie that's going to be for everyone but it's it's a movie that's at least going to get a lot of people talking and sharing sharing their experience with it because you might not like the film but you definitely felt the film is how is how I'll wrap that up so i'm going i'm giving the film a 9 out of 10 it's one of my favorite movies of the year easily um so yeah i'm going to get into spoilers now for long legs so if you've not seen the film i would recommend watching it uh before you watch this part of the video so 3 Two, one, you've been warned. So uh, come to the third act of the film, you realize uh, what Long Legs has been doing and how he he himself has not really, never really killed anyone, at least not personally, but he has influenced all these families to kill themselves and to kill other people. And you learn that because of the dolls of the film, because um, he, the character himself, and what uh, what I heard before the movie came out, and what someone described uh, lo- the character of Long Legs as, is like an evil Geppetto of sorts, because he himself creates these dolls that he sends to these families um, as birthday gifts, and each of the people, each of these families that he kills, uh, all get killed on a, a, a family member's birthday. M- most notably the younger daughter um and each um and he makes a a doll version of each of these little girls um and sends them to these families uh, right before their birthday and that's where he influences these people using some kind of satanic magic um where he puts that uh those that kind of like weird ball into the head of the doll and or these dolls and that's where the whispers come into play 
uh, these these demonic whispers that he that influence these families to start killing each other and um, eventually the father killing themselves. So it's just a lot of people may may find that uh, revel, uh, that reveal of how like these murders happen, like how it's it's revolves around some kind of black magic. Um, a lot of people will find that very silly. For me, anyway, I didn't really find it that silly because it, it just I I expected there to be a supernatural element to the film, and I do not think it it to me anyway. It never came off as silly or forced. It always had that kind of vibe going throughout. Like there's this isn't just the standard like serial killings that are happening here. There's something bigger at play, and. One of the easily one of the mo- more eerie parts of the film is whenever um, the, you see those dolls in those black veils um, that Long Legs wraps these dolls up into. Um, you always see, and you see this in the trailer too, where you see this face, or you see at least these eyes that emerge from the faces of these dolls underneath this black cloak thing, and they're red, and you. At a, a brief glance, you wouldn't even be able to tell it's a face. But when you look closely at it, it just immediately, for me anyway, like you see that in the trailer. And when you look at it closely, it just, for me anyway, it just made me feel so uncomfortable. And I, I love stuff like that where you almost have to look closer at the screen until you see what's truly there to be frightened of. And I love stuff like that in the film. Um, and it does that kind of thing uh, all throughout it. And you also see um, the, the I don't know if it's actually Satan himself, but you it's some kind of de- demon form that you see all throughout the film in the corner or very far away or tucked away in the shadows. Uh, like especially near the end where it kind of does that um, exposition uh, revolving around how long legs works and how these killings all take place and it's delivered by Alicia Witt's character and it's um you see uh, a young Lee Harker uh when uh you realize that she was one of she was almost going to be one of the victims of long legs and because um and I think it's because that uh Alicia Witt who plays the mother Ruth Harker because she wasn't be able she wasn't able to be influenced to kill uh Lee as a child um, that caused long legs to interfere with her, and that caused um, her to basically sacrifice herself in a way to save her daughter, to save Lee Harker, and um, that made her become his accomplice in c- carrying out these all these mass murders with these families. And um, you realize that she is bringing the doll, each of these dolls, to the families that were killed. And um, yeah, and in one of the shots that you see of Lee Harker as a child, um, she's in her bedroom. It's very dark, but uh, right behind her, she's in the bottom corner. She's in the bottom half of the of the screen, and you see just emerging from the darkness that those horns and that very tall black form coming out. It's so well done, and it, it just it just makes you. It just gives you the creeps, or at least it gave me the creeps. Just stuff like that just really gets under my skin. Stuff like um, the movie really reminded me of the first time I saw Hereditary, the first time I saw Long Legs uh, at the premiere. And I went to see this movie with Paul uh, fr- from the show. And um, it just immediately when it does that, just it made us feel uncomfortable and just always feeling like almost like we're being watched as we're watching this film. And I, I love that stuff, you know? And, uh, of course, uh, now that I can talk more about the, the character of Long Legs and what Nick Cage looks like in the film and how the part he plays in it, and he's not in the film as much as you might think he is, but I think he's in the film just enough because um, the film does a very good job of not really showing his face. Um, and when you do see his face it in the beginning ha- in the beginning part of the film like in the opening scene which is one of the which immediately sets the mood for the film and just immediately 
is it, he, this is one of the best like opening scenes for a horror film I've seen in a long time where uh, it's it's long legs approaching Lee Harker's house and she and she's a child and he's giving her the doll um, but um, you're not it, what what's great about the movie is that the scene is kind of spread out all across the film in different parts and revealing different inf- pieces of information that help you piece along uh, what's actually happening here. And um, there's a part where long legs is, re- is not really shown. His face isn't shown, but you see it from like the nose down uh, <clears throat> and you don't really see his face that much until Nicholas cage in the frame ducks down in the frame very quickly. And then it c- smash cuts to the title that was the moment where me and Paul looked at each other and were like, this is going to be one of the best films of the year. Like, good God. I love I love the opening scene of this film so much, and it just immediately puts you on edge uh, for the, what the rest of the film is going to bring you. And it uh, establishes the mystery of the film very well because you're not entirely sure who the kid is unless you really... Uh, unless you really paid attention to the marketing. You're not entirely sure who it is, but over the course of the film, you realize that little girl is Lee Harker as a young, at a, at a younger age. Um, so yeah. And you eventually find out that Mike, uh, Lee Harker wasn't, has the reason why she has all these psychic abilities is that she, um, because her mother has worked with long legs, um, Lee Harker herself has been influenced by these demonic voices, like the devil himself, the devil himself has been talking to her uh, mentally and psychologically. And um, she, the devil himself has been giving her these these visions, as, as I'd like to call them. Um, and w- uh, the moment of the film, the turning point is when uh, Ruth Harker, when after Long Legs kills himself in that interrogation scene, which is amazing. I mean, Nicolas Cage's performance in that film, in that scene in particular, is just, it's awe-inspiring. Um, full, Nicolas Cage going full out in that scene, especially, um, and doing all that weird, those weird Nicolas Cage movements. But it, it, to me, anyway, it never came off as, like, funny. It always came across as, like, genuinely unnerving and kind of terrifying. Um and uh, n- yeah, Long Legs kills himself after he delivers the line "Hail Satan," and um, yeah, he kills himself right there, and he's out of the movie, and that's like towards the end of the second act, and you're wondering where is this gonna go for the rest of the movie? And Lee Harker goes back to her mom's house because uh, Long Legs mentions her mother and asks her to. Uh, get her to tell more about what's happening here. And um, you eventually find out that, yes, Ruth Harker is the accomplice of long legs across uh, these past couple decades. And um, Ruth Harker shoots the doll of of Lee Harker, uh, who she has kept, and she shoots it in the head. And she does that in a way to free her from uh, the effects of... Uh, of Satan himself is how I is how I pictured it, and that's where you get the mo- the montage of the exposition and what's happening here, and um, the ending is where Lee Harker uh, goes to the birthday party of Blair Underwood's family um, because he has a he has a daughter who's turning nine and she get she gets her own doll, and Lee Harker um, uh, goes into the house. And the mother's there, uh, Ruth Harker's there, and um, it's just a really uncomfortable scene. And you're not, um, you, you know it's coming, but you almost feel like the characters are powerless to stop what's coming because some. I'll, I it, on first watch, I had a an issue with the ending because it it seemed like Lee Harker at any moment could just shot done something to the doll, and that would have like stopped you know, the family from being killed. Um, and that would have, you know, stopped what what eventually did happen was that everyone gets killed except for her and the daughter. But she cannot shoot the doll 
after you know she kills sh- she shoots and kills the rest of the family and i i i feel like that at first on first viewing i thought that was a cop out like it it felt kind of like a forced way to have like a kind of like the the good guys lose and the and evil prevails kind of ending but i think on the third watch uh which i watched it again yesterday i i thought about it differently and i feel like the ending was not really about you know what lee was able to do in that what she was not able to do and because when she walks in that room with everyone inside and the and the dolls there you already feel like it's already too late like everyone is going to be influenced by by these whispers and these you know by the demonic doll that is already there and ev- it's it's already too late and already evil has has prevailed and um to me for me anyway on on the on multiple viewings i feel like that may that ending makes more sense to me and I'll, i've heard some complaints about the ending too of what i was saying like it felt like kind of a cop out and it felt kind of forced but for i think the more i watch it the more i will will like the ending and more appreciate what the ending is going for um and you know the ending of the film is just Nick Cage going hail Satan. And then it cuts the credits. Yeah. Uh, this film really impacted me in a lot of ways. Um, and I, for me, for me, I think the film did exactly what it should have done. And I think the film lived up to its potential. The film might not have scared me in the way that maybe the trailers might've led me to believe, but it, like I said, it, it, any horror film that makes me this uncomfortable is doing something right. And any, like, um, it's definitely not the type of film that's going to scare everyone or it's not going to affect everyone like it did me. But I, I still recommend a lot of ho- any horror fan to see this film and try, like, come out, of, like, try to get something out of it at least. Um, because I do think it will still it's still going to start a conversation um, about what, you know, everything that happens in the film, the performances, um, all the technical accolades that the film has. I mean, this film is truly gorgeous to look at. The score is in immensely creepy. Um, the sound design is great. Um, it's, I think it's a truly great film and one of the best, probably my favorite horror film of the year. Um, and we've still, and there's been a lot of great horror films this year in general. Um, but I, uh, I truly think this film might stand out above the rest. And there's still, we've still got quite a few horror films left this year um, throughout the rest of it. So I'm very excited to see what we've got next in store. So that's my review of Long Legs, spoilers and non-spoilers uh, all across the board. So I hope you guys enjoyed my discussion of Long Legs, and I hope you guys have checked it out. And if you enjoyed this video, I recommend that you guys like and subscribe and keep, keep on coming for more. So take care. We have been the Cinema Asylum Podcast. You guys were awesome! Thanks for coming out! Good night!